Thank you, Linda. Okay, uh, our final speaker tonight is Richard Webb, who incidentally is no relation of mine. Uh, I want to make that very clear. Um, he is a uh, deputy features editor at New Scientist. Uh, before that, he was an editor at Nature, and before that, a particle physicist at CERN, where he studied the very living nothingness that is the interior of the proton. Today, Richard is going to be talking to us about the origins of zero. Thank you, Jeremy, and good evening, everybody. I feel that um, following Helen, I should ta start this talk with a disclaimer as well. This talk may also induce nausea. This is because this talk includes some maths. <laughs> so, there we have some maths. This is the first piano axiom. The piano axioms were devised in the late 19th century by the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Piano, and they are the basic logical rules that underlie the process of counting, of doing arithmetic. Now, this statement is somewhat controversial. Zero, a natural number? Really? Because the natural numbers are the numbers we use for counting. One, two, three, four. And it's not immediately obvious that you can count nothing. It's not immediately obvious that nothing is really something that needs a mathematical representation at all. And it gets worse. Because zero is not a number like any other number. What happens when you add two numbers together? You get a larger number, except if one of those numbers is zero. Then nothing happens. We can maybe accept that, but what happens when you multiply a number by zero? Something very different. That number itself disappears. It's collapsed down and eaten by zero. The only result of multiplying by zero is zero. And let's not even get into what happens when you divide a number by zero. That, incidentally, is something you can read more about in the book. I say this because perhaps it will bring more understanding for what I'm going to talk about, which is why, which is how, at every stage in Zero's historical development, it's been encountered by mistrust, misapprehension, and even fear. At the same time, I'm going to try to convince you that Zero is indeed a natural number, and indeed more than that. It's the most natural, essential number for arithmetic, and indeed the whole of mathematics that there is. So the first thing about zero is that it's not nothing, it's something. In fact, it's two things. It's a symbol and a number. And although they're intimately related, they are not the same thing, and they have two very different histories. And zero, the symbol, was the first to emerge by a long chalk. In its original incarnation, at least, its job was as punctuation, as a placeholder. And we see an example of this in a very familiar number, this year's date, in our conventional numerical notation today. Now, not every representation of a number needs one of these placeholder zeros. Our number system does because it's what's known as a positional system. That is to say, one symbol can take on different values according to where it appears in the number. So, for example, we're used to the fact that here in this number 2013, that 2 isn't a 2 at all, it's 2,000. That's because we work under a decimal system, which works with powers of 10. Now, the thing is, as soon as you adopt a positional system, it becomes crucial to know where a symbol is in a number. And so, if, for example, in this, as in this number, where you have no hundreds, you need to know that. You need a placeholder to put in place to make sure you know this is 2013, not 213, not 2 and 13, not 20,013, or whatever else you might think it was. So as soon as you adopt a positional number system, you need a placeholder zero. And that makes it all the more odd that it takes 1,500 years before the adoption, between the adoption of the first positional number system to where the first placeholder zero appears. 
The first positional number system dates back to ancient Babylonia in about 1800 BC, and it was very different to our positional notation. It wasn't based on powers of 10, but powers of 60, and it had only two symbols, one for one and one for 10. So, this is 2013 in this first Babylonian positional notational system. It just happens to have a rather pleasingly symmetrical representation because 2013 just happens to be 33 times 60, the base of the system, plus another, th another 33. So what you get are two identical clumps of symbols, one representing 33 times 60, one representing 33 times 1, add them together, you get 2013. Question, though, is that number 2013? Or is it this number, 118,833? It's not a number I've plucked out of thin air. It just happens to be the next power of 60 up, 60 squared, 3,600 times 33, plus another 33. The point is, for the first 1,500 years of the Babylonian positional system, there was no way to tell this number apart from 2013 that we had earlier, apart from maybe a little bit of extra white space between those two clumps of numbers. And we have very many examples in, for example, astronomical tablets that survive from this era of the kind of miscalculations and ambiguities that result. But it's only in 300 BC that someone has clearly had enough. And this is what happens. Those two spatula-like diagonal symbols in red there are the world's first symbolic representation of nothing, <laughs> of empty space within a number. It's telling us here that in this particular number, there's something missing. There's no power of 60. So this number is indeed 118,833 and not 2013. Now, purely from a bookkeeping point of view, this was clearly a good idea. In fact, it was such a good idea that the placeholder zero was invented for a second time, two centuries later, on the other side of the world, by the Maya, who also independently invented their own positional number system, in their case based on powers of 20, and independently invented a placeholder zero. Theirs looked rather like that in my crude um, drawing. It looks rather, I don't know how you would describe that, a conch shell or a closed eye, something like that. But the point is, that neither the Mayans nor the Babylonians made the crucial mental leap of saying, what happens when you liberate that symbol zero from its environment within another number and give it a life of its own, rip it out of its context and say, what happens if you make that representation of nothingness itself a number that you can manipulate mathematically, that can it itself be the result of a mathematical calculation. And to give an illustration of what was missing, here is a transliteration from a Babylonian text after the placeholder zero was invented in 300 BC. This is a text to do the, with the distribution of grain in storehouses, and it's full of mathematical calculations, and it's riddled with the placeholder zero. But there comes a point where the scribe writes something down that to our modern intuition screams out, the answer's zero. And what does the scribe write down? 20 minus 20 equals, in longhand, the grain is finished. There is no number zero. Now the next civilization to deal in any great style with numbers were the ancient Greeks, and they too failed to liberate zero. That's perhaps not entirely surprising because the Greek conception of number was entirely geometrical. They were wedded to the idea that numbers represented geometrical shapes. And what shape can correspond to nothing? To the Greek conception, it could only be the void. And as Jeremy has already said, the void was a concept that was anathema to the dominant cosmology of the time. The product of Aristotle and his disciples, it saw Earth at the center of a series of concentric crystal spheres that contained the stars and the planets, set in motion by an unmoved mover, and filled 
not with nothing, but with this invisible substance called the ether. And as Jeremy's mentioned, this, this picture was eagerly co-opted by early Christian philosophers who saw in the unmoved mover a ready-made identity for God. And it remained the dominant strand of Western philosophy for the next 2,000 years, more or less. And with it was the idea that everything that was nothing, that was void, that was empty space, that was zero, was somehow ungodly. Now, Eastern philosophies, among them the, the principally the, the Hindu philosophies, um, with, their, with our ideas of um, eternal cycles of creation and destruction, didn't have this problem with the void. And that's why, possibly, for the next crucial stage of zero's development, for the invention of zero as a number, we have to look to the east of Babylon. There in 7th century India, the Hindu astronomer Brahma Gupta clearly feels the freedom to ask questions such as, what happens if I subtract from a number a number of greater size? As we've seen, this is the kind of question that would have bamboozled the Babylonians. And with, for the Greeks, with their purely geometrical conception of number, it too was a nonsense. How can you subtract from one area an area of greater size? It just makes no sense geometrically or physically. But Brahma Gupta, Gupta clearly has no such qualms. And in his great mathematical treatise, the Brahma Putra Siddhanta, written in 628 AD, he writes down a series of rules for how to manipulate quantities that can be translated as debts and fortunes, where for the first time, zero is being treated as a mathematical quantity in its own right that can itself be manipulated, be the result of a calculation. And if we look through these rules, we see something very similar to the conception of how zero works today. For example, the rules at the bottom, the product of zero multiplied by itself is nothing. The product of zero multiplied by anything else is zero. But that is to understate the significance of what Brahma Gupta has done. What he's done, you can see by replacing that word debt by negative number and fortune by positive number. For the first time, he has liberated the whole system of numbers from this idea of counting, that numbers can only be about things in the physical world, one, two, three, concrete things I can touch. And what he's done, he's replaced it with the modern, abstract idea of numbers as sitting on a continuous line from minus infinity, past negative numbers, past debts, to past positive numbers, fortunes, to positive infinity. And as soon as you do this, as soon as you conceptualize numbers in, the, in this way, there, at the center, at the pivot of your number system, separating negative from positive, is a quantity that Brahmagupta called shunya, the void. And this was zero, the number. Now, it didn't take long after that for Hindu mathematicians to unite zero the number with zero the symbol, and with it invents the notation we're all familiar with today, the, the decimal positional notation with its ten digits ranging from zero to nine. And as soon as you do that, you realize that even zero the symbol is more than just a symbol, more than just a placeholder. In this system, zero itself becomes a mathematical operator that brings the power of the base of the system to bear. These are things that we're intuitively used to, but they're not intuitively obvious at all. What happens when you add a zero onto the end of a number? You multiply it by the base, 10. What happens when you add two numbers together and the, the total in a column ticks up past 7, 8, 9 to 10? You put a zero there, carry the one, create a ten. These are amazingly muscular, supple, efficient algorithms for manipulating numbers that we take for granted. But you need zero to make them happen. 